Televiziunea Română, întâlnirile JTI și Fundația Art Production vă recomandă garantat 100%. Salutare, bine v-am regăsit la Garantat 100%. Invitatul nostru s-a născut în Brooklyn, New York. Este o personalitate proeminentă a politicii externe a Statelor Unite ale Americii. A studiat și predă la instituții de învățământ din elita mondială, cum ar fi, printre altele, universitățile Oxford și Harvard. A lucrat în Departamentul de Stat și în Senatul American. Între 1989 și 1993 a fost asistent special al președintelui George H. W. Bush, și director în Consiliul Național de Securitate. Între 2001 și 2003 a fost director al planificării politice în Departamentul de Stat și a fost consilier principal al secretarului de stat Colin Powell. A fost coordonator al politicilor pentru viitorul Afganistanului și trimisul american în procesul de pace din Irlanda de Nord. De 18 ani este președintele Consiliului pentru Relații Externe, o organizație de excelentă reputație din Statele Unite. Este autorul mai multor cărți și studii, cea mai recentă, tradusă și în limba română, poartă titlul Lumea în care trăim, o scurtă introducere. Cartea este deja un New York Times bestseller. E publicată la editura Nemira și le mulțumesc pe calea asta, prietenilor de la editura Nemira, pentru mijlocirea acestei întâlniri. E o onoare să-l avem ca invitat la Garantat 100% pe domnul Richard N. Haas. Dr. Haas, good evening and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. No, thank you so much for, for having me here. Your book is a real manual, and I do thank you for this book. It's a real manual about the basic understanding of how the world works as a mechanism, more or less precise, but full of meanings. And my first question is, why do you think that the universities do not teach courses to the students in order to explain the world we live in. We all have a partial understanding of the world we live in. Why are the universities so reluctant in that? I can answer the, your question, which is an important one, about American universities and universities more broadly. I think particularly in my country, America has a long tradition of not focusing on the world until really World War II, we did not have any consistent involvement in the world. Mm -hmm. Our first president, when he left office, warned Americans against what he described as entangling alliances. Uh, so this, the, the tradition of isolationism or ignoring the world is fairly well entrenched in the United States. In many ways, the last, what, 70, 75 years or something of an exception in American uh, history. Uh, and I think after, in particular now, after uh, the end of the Cold War, after the bad experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, mm -hmm. and given all of our domestic troubles, a lot of Americans are really looking inward. So that, that's partially it. And that's reflected in what they study at universities. Second of all, many universities in my country in particular, I, I can't speak to Romania, are reluctant to tell students, you have to take this course before you get your diploma. In America, there's a tradition of tremendous choice in what you mm -hmm. study with only a modest amount of uh, direction. Students are meant to be intellectually ready to make their own choices. I disagree with that. And I believe universities have the responsibility to define themselves and to say to a student, look, this is what we here think you ought to know before you go out in the world. You may disagree, in which case, This may not be the university for you. I think it would actually be a healthy uh, competition. Uh, but for those and probably other reasons, uh, a lot of young people around the world, plus you have to remember, most people don't go to university. Or if they go, they go to a two-year school totally and then they right. focus on learning more a trade. So I think we have, to, we have to think about the broader population. Dr. Haas, in your book, you use the syntagm, global literacy, and literacy is not used in the perspective of 
reading or writing. It's not about that. It's a more profound concept. What do you understand by literacy in your book? You're right. Normally, when we use the word literacy or global literacy, we're thinking about what percentage of the people in the world can read and understand at an adult level. And it turns out, by the way, uh, about 85% of the people in the world can read, uh, which also means about a billion people cannot, which is quite, quite worrisome, because if, particularly if young women can't read, how are they going to get the skills they need? How mm -hmm. are they going to know what medicines they need and so forth? So it's, it's really quite... It's, we still have a ways to go. But when I use the phrase, Catalina, as you say, uh, global literacy, I'm speaking about a, uh, an understanding of a familiarity with uh, the basic concepts about why the world matters, what the basic relationships are, uh, how the world operates. I don't mean at a level to make you a foreign minister or the head of the United Nations, but a basic level that a citizen, uh, I believe, needs in order to make informed decisions as a, a citizen politically or informed decisions in their, in their personal lives. You have been actively involved in the situation of Afghanistan. Now, America is getting out of that place. Is this another lost war? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a direct question and a difficult one to answer. A lot depends upon how you define a lost or won war. Right. What is your definition of success in Afghanistan? If the idea was it was going to lead to a, a wonderful democracy, say a, a strong, with strong civil society, a, a country like Romania, unlike, that was never to me uh, possible. Was it to win militarily? No, that was never to me uh, possible or to bring peace, no. Uh, I always thought the goal in Afghanistan, the principal goal was to make sure it could never again be used like it was used 20 years ago as a training ground, as a venue for terrorists. That to me was the principal goal of our policy. And I thought that was, uh, that was and we have achieved that uh, mm -hmm. to, to a large, uh, to a large, end. if we could also make Afghanistan better in the process, fantastic. And I think we've done a degree of that. I think it's too bad that we're, we're leaving because so much of the rationale for leaving was again based upon unrealistic goals or an unrealistic definition of success. And I argued that we should be prepared to stay for this important but modest goal of avoiding again a return of terrorism so long as we could keep the cost modest. And I thought 2,500 American troops, and by the way, there has not been a, a fatality for an American troop in combat for over a year now in some 14 months, yep. another what, 7,000 or so European troops, NATO troops, I thought was a reasonable insurance policy. Obviously, uh, you know, I may be the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. The president of the United States disagreed with me. How will you define populism as a matter of fact? Populism can to some extent be capitalist, can also to some extent be what you might call statist. Yep. Usually it has a larger state role. And it's the triumph or the emphasis of individuals mm -hmm. over institutions. Of, uh, and what makes it so dangerous is the rule of law, uh, process, and the rest can be overwhelmed by the preferences of a powerful in individual at the top. And essentially what happens over time is societies that become more populous tend to become one, less democratic, and secondly, as you suggest, less capitalist, because often what happens is the resources of the state are increasingly used almost as fuel on a fire to improve the political prospects of the, of the individual in charge. When the war in Iraq had begun, you were a high-ranking official in the State Department. Your position was against the war. Why was that? Well, I'd also been uh, an official in the U.S. government during the previous, uh, the so-called right. Gulf War in 1990 and 91 after Saddam Hussein of Iraq invaded Kuwait. And I was President Bush, the father's, his principal advisor on the Middle East during that crisis. And at that time, you will recall, in early 1991, when the battle was going rather well for the coalition, we had to make the decision about whether to, quote unquote, go to Baghdad. And at the time we looked at it and I argued, as did others, that we should not. 
that to go to Baghdad and remove the government would create potentially conditions of chaos and create uh, conditions of enormous responsibility for us that we uh, that I wasn't sure we wanted to uh, carry out. Mm -hmm. I did not think Iraq was a society that was uh, on the edge of being ready to be a stable, democratic uh, society. And at the end of the day, for many reasons, we did not, quote unquote, go to Baghdad in 1991. When the war, when the possibility of war came up in 2002, I argued against it for two reasons. One was I thought we had other alternative policies that were, would give us acceptable results to uh, limit what Saddam Hussein uh, was able to do. I thought there was a lot we could do, for example, to strengthen sanctions. But secondly, I said, if we go to Baghdad this time, if we remove political authority, the existing political authority, uh, my view was pretty much what it was a decade before. And I said, we looked at this, the basics haven't changed. This is not a society that will be stable, but rather we will create conditions of enormous instability. And either we will let the instability to continue my metaphor, rage like a wildfire, or we will have to be, we will have to try to put it out. And putting it out will take enormous amounts of uh, military and economic and political uh, effort. And I said, it's simply not worth it. Uh, but I uh, obviously lost that conversation. I lost that uh, debate. And unfortunately, I think a lot of what happened suggested that I was more right than wrong. How do you feel when you lose? Um this type of, um, of battle. It's a discursive battle. How do you feel when you lose it? <laughs> it's very funny you ask it. Well, I'll tell you two things. One is, look, first of all, when you're in government, you lose battles all, all the time. You can't expect not to lose battles. Uh, but I think when you're in government, particularly when you're like me, as a, I was a political appointee, I was not a career person. You have to ask yourself, uh, are you losing too many battles? It's almost like a team in a football league. Uh, at some yep. point, you have to look at your record and you say, am I uh, in the right place? Am I having the influence? And in particular, when you lose a big battle. And Iraq wasn't just a, another battle. The decision to go to war in Iraq, I thought, would be the, the critical decision of this administration. So I was losing most of the battles. I used to, my wife and I had a, uh, we had a code for this. And these were known as, uh, we used to call them professional days. And a professional day was a day that I lost the battle. But then I would be asked to go on television or to fly to Europe that night to explain to the allies why we did what, why we made the decision we did. And what would wow. often happen is I would hear from the allies the same arguments I had used. Uh, and then I had to argue with them. And those were known as professional days. And I, had a, I was having too many of those. And again, I lost this big argument, and I just said, I'm not comfortable publicly uh, defending this policy. And just to be clear, I also, I not only lost the battle on whether to go to war, I also lost the battle about how to prepare for the aftermath. And one of my other books several years ago, yeah. uh, I wrote a book about the two Iraq wars, and I, I, I included in the book the memorandum I sent to the Secretary of State, to Colin Powell, which he then sent to the president and the vice president and the secretary of defense and others. And I said, if you're going to go to war, here's all the things you need to take into account yep. in order to prepare. And I lost that as well. It was as if people were not willing to acknowledge the difficulty of the enterprise, because mm -hmm. if the enterprise was going to be that difficult, maybe people then would say, well, maybe we shouldn't do it. So at the end of the day, I decided I was not having a, uh, meaningful influence and i was increasingly being asked to defend policies i disagreed with and at some point uh one has to look in the mirror and say am i comfortable doing this and i i ultimately concluded uh this was not the right position for me i will go on with this question um asking you if you ever think about the fact that behind all those professional days um all those normal days as a matter of fact at the office whether you lose or you win, backwards, there's the history of humanity. There are lives of thousands of people. There are things that sometimes are irreversible. Do you think about that? 
It's, it's, it's a really interesting question. Probably not enough. When we're in office situations, when we're working 16, 18 hour days, yeah. sometimes five, five, six, seven days a week, there's a tendency at times to deal with these things as abstractions. And I think that's unhealthy. I think it's really important to constantly remind yourself that these are decisions that affect people's lives. These are decisions that could, have, could end people's lives. One of the things uh, President Bush, the father, but also President Bush, the junior, the younger, were, they would often visit the, the military troops. And the reason I thought it was really important, I would go with them, particularly President Bush, the father, because these were the young men and women we were asked to implement these decisions. So it wasn't simply a, a box you would check on a piece of paper. These were real decisions that would cost, that would change people's lives. And in many cases cost their lives uh, in the Americans, but also non-Americans. So I think it's important when you're in government to go the extra mile so that what you're dealing with becomes real, uh, that it's not a, uh, not instruction. My own view is you owe that to the people whose lives uh, you, you are uh, you're affecting. One of the things I try to do when I, is, and I tell people now, when people would be going into the Biden administration, I would say, get out of your office every now and then. These jobs are so demanding and you've got to get out and get the feedback and yep. see how decisions you are taking are affecting the day-to-day -day lives but it's harder now with COVID, but I still think it's an important thing to do. Otherwise, these decisions become abstractions, mm -hmm. and that's dangerous. Uh, that, that's not healthy. Dr. Haas, will you allow me for two questions to be the devil's advocate? Absolutely. I will express two possible questions from that part of the audience which is preoccupied, let's say, with the conspiracy theories. One of the questions would be, is this COVID-19 a war between China and the USA? Absolutely not. COVID broke out in China. The Chinese mishandled this outbreak. But this is a, a war, if you will, between the virus and mankind. And we have, initially the virus was winning, in part because of its own strength, but mainly because of our own failures. And I think now we've somewhat turned the tide. I think the, uh, what's been accomplished with the vaccines is really miraculous, miraculous. Uh, but in, we're not, at least in the United States and some other countries like India, Brazil, Mexico, so forth, yep. the government societies are not taking the other steps they need to, distancing, wearing masks. And so and a lot of people, were, even in the United States, where millions and millions are getting vaccinated, Millions and millions are choosing not to. There's what's called here vaccine hesitancy. So I would say we're winning the war, but almost like a war on terrorism. I don't think this war ends anytime soon. I think this war with the virus continues. But no, this is not a war between the United States and China. But I will say the U.S.-Chinese relationship before we ever heard of COVID-19 was already deteriorating significantly. And I can't sit here with confidence and say the this relationship is going to get better anytime soon. This is a, a very difficult relationship. It's increasingly defined by competition, by friction. And the challenge, it seems to me, is to make sure the, the friction does not spill over into conflict. And the challenge is to see if we can still maintain, say, uh, on Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which you mentioned, on North Korea, on climate, some areas of cooperation, even though the overall relationship is highly, is highly competitive. The second question from the point of view of the conspiracy theory supporters would be something like this. Is this COVID-19 a lucky and accepted opportunity to stop a very alarming migration besieging USA and Europe? Absolutely not. There's nothing lucky about it. Uh, the only possible good side of it would be that it's accelerated the emergence of a new generation of vaccines using these new technologies, which might have might have potential uses, not just with COVID-19, but against a whole range of infections. Uh, no, if anything, on the even if there was a temporary slowing down of uh, migration, mm -hmm. it's actually going to accelerate. 
We're seeing it uh, along the southern border. One of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons we're seeing increased pressure on the southern border of the United States is because the United States is doing far better than Mexico and other countries in South America at dealing with COVID. And as a result, our economy is recovering at a far greater rate yep. than their economies. And that difference is, is pulling people into toward the, toward the uh, United States. And I think that'll be a pattern around the world that countries which are suffering from real problems with COVID and whose economic recovery as a result is delayed or much, much slower, we're gonna see migration from those areas into places where economies are growing faster in part because they've been more successful at dealing with COVID. There's a huge difference in between the Cold War and the contemporary tensions between USA and China. In the 20th century, the separation was very clear in practical terms. Now, there's a Chinese restaurant in every small town of the Western world. What would you say about that? I think the basic premise of the question is right. The Soviet Union, while it was a political and an ideological and a military challenge, economically it was separate. It basically chose a path of economic, it refused, for example, to participate in the Marshall Plan after uh, World War II in the early stages of the Cold War. And instead it created essentially a parallel, separate economic system. And you don't need me to explain this to you, given where you're sitting. Uh, China's taken a fundamentally different path. China, beginning, what, 20, 25 years ago, essentially made the decision to integrate with the rest of the world economically. Mm -hmm. And it is integrated to a phenomenal degree, has been wildly successful. Uh, China, uh, as a result today, is the world's second largest economy. At some point, will probably become the world's largest economy or, or close to it. And as a result, it is already in many ways integrated. So to talk about containing it or isolating it is a much more complicated proposition. We can probably restrict some flows of technology, but it will be difficult given how many things are in the open. And the issue isn't Chinese restaurants, but it's, it's, it's <laughs> Chinese technology and Chinese manufacturers and Chinese investment. So, and, and to make it even more complicated, we see it in Europe, we see it in Asia, a lot of countries have intimate economic relations with China. At the same time, strategically, they're allies of ours. And the question going forward, and it's going to be really, really difficult to manage, is how do, we, how do we deal with this reality, this dual reality of economic integration with China, yet we have ideological differences and obviously military concerns. How do we manage this? Because we, we cannot force countries to choose. They are not, if we say, you've got to either be with us or be with China, that's not a question we can successfully put to them. So we're gonna to have to figure out how do, we, how do we manage both sets of relationships simultaneously. As a result, I actually think this is going to be more difficult to manage than the Cold War. I actually think this is a more demanding era of diplomacy or foreign policy, mm -hmm. simply because the challenge posed by China has all these extra dimensions. I obviously used the Chinese restaurant as a metaphor, obviously, <laughs> for this type of integration. Yes, economical and personal integration, as a matter of fact. But 100%, let's, I know that. Let's talk a little bit about Ukraine. Yes, we sir. as Romanians are close, very close from this hot point on the map. And this fact is raising some very justified concerns here. What do you think? Will we have a conventional war? in between the Western world and Russia? I think probably not, but I don't know what Mr. Putin's uh, goals are right now in Ukraine. I mean, obviously we know before this most recent phase of the crisis, he, he had zero intention to ever give up Crimea. And it was very hard to see how he would get out of Eastern Ukraine. I think in some ways he's trapped in Eastern Ukraine. If he leaves, he is worried about reprisals against ethnic Russians there, and that would be politically uh, very damaging to him. Uh, so, but why he's now done this buildup, this mobilization, I'll be honest, I, I, I don't have a good uh, analysis 
And I don't know whether this is a sign of strength, whether this is a distraction, whether this might be preparation for going in. I don't have a good answer for it. Mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me, before we, you asked me about Iraq, there was a big debate in July of 1990 as Iraq began its buildup along its border with Kuwait. What are its intentions? Yep. We can measure capabilities, but understanding intentions is impossible. Same thing here. We can, we can count the Russian divisions and troops and all that, but I can't sit here with any confidence and say this is a, what we would call gunboat diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Maybe Mr. Uh, Putin will have some demands from Ukraine, whether this is dis a distraction from COVID, the economy, from Navalny. I don't know. Uh, and even if it begins as a distraction, sometimes leaders get trapped uh, in their own momentum. So I don't. I don't have a, a you know, clear insight into mm -hmm. it, but um, at best, though, he demobilizes. I think if he does take more, goes against more against Ukraine, we can help Ukraine indirectly with arms, you know, shipments. We can look at more sanctions, but I, I don't see this as a triggering a war with, 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 mm. with Russia because I don't believe we would go down that path. Now I have a rather rhetorical question, but I'm pretty sure that lots of my compatriots would ask this question. So, you know for sure that my grandparents, like many other Romanian grandparents at that time, were desperately waiting for the Americans. And they've been occupied instead by the Russians, more precisely by the Soviets. Now the Americans are here. Are they here to stay? You know, a couple of years ago, I would have said yes, without any hesitancy. And what we learned over the last four years when Mr. Trump was president <laughs> is that things that we thought were what you might call givens or assumptions, permanent features of American foreign policy, maybe not. Because he raised questions about America's alliances in Japan, Korea. He was going to take, what was it, 10,000 or so troops out of uh, Germany uh, and so forth. So, and what I don't know is in the future, after Mr. Biden is president, whether it's another Amer whether it's another Democratic president or another Republican president, what is now permanent about American foreign policy? So my, my answer to your question is, yes, I think we will stay there, but I'm not as 100% sure as I used to be. Mm -hmm. And that I don't like giving you that answer. I'll be honest. There's now a we have introduced a degree of uh, unpredictability. And one of the things I would look for, and it deals a little bit with the Democratic left, but even more with what you might call the, re the Republican right, the people who are very mm -hmm. close to Mr. Trump, is l I'm looking for signs as to what is their thinking about America's role in the world. Because uh, every up to now, think about it. Every American president from Harry Truman, who was the first of the post-World War II presidents, yep. all the way through Barack Obama, for all their differences from Reagan to Nixon to Kennedy, whatever, for all their differences, there were actually far more similarities than differences in their approach to NATO, in their approach to the world. Right. Trump was the first one who introduced a range of uh, discontinuity that to me was profound. Biden is back in the tradition of the post-World War II presidents. And again, the question is after Biden, when we have the generational change, because mm -hmm. Biden is also the last of his generation, uh, what does America's relationship with the world look like? So I think we'll have the answer to your question probably you know, in the next uh, 10, 15 years maximum. I hope the answer is yes. I hope the answer is the United States will remain part of this alliance system in Europe and this other one in the Asia Pacific. Uh, these, these two great alliance systems have served us uh, well. Uh, and I think that's the likely answer, but I don't think it's 100% certain. If you were in my shoes as a Romanian citizen, would you be concerned about this? Uh, if I were in your shoes, yes. And I would be thinking about what 
two things. One, what could be done to increase the odds Americans would stay? Yep. To demonstrate the importance of uh, yourselves, you know, that it's a two-way street. And then probably if I were a Romanian official, I'd be thinking a little bit in the back of my mind about what happens if uh, one day, whether it's in five years or 50 years, the Americans do decide to leave. And what are the alternatives? And you know, whenever a country faces that kind of a situation, you could say, do we have other strong neighbors we could ally ourselves with? In this case, it would be other Europeans. Uh, you don't want to face your Russian friends and neighbors on your own. Uh, that's an imbalance. Uh, so I would base, if I were a European, I would say we want the, al the alliance relationship, the, Euro the Atlantic Alliance, to endure as long into the future as possible, to be as robust as possible. But we need to begin to make sure we have something of a European fallback. How is Romania perceived at this very moment in the political sphere in Washington and in the groups of experts responsible for the foreign policy strategies of USA. It's good you're sitting down because now I'm going to break your heart. <laughs> yeah. It's not the biggest topic of conversation. When most Americans get up in the morning yep. and they uh, put on their, they lace up their shoes, I don't think they're thinking about Romania for the most part. And what I would go on to say is they're not thinking about foreign policy for the most part. So don't take it personally. Uh, Americans are thinking about their personal lives, like most Romanians are thinking about their lives, about making ends meet, their job, their marriage, what have you. And they're thinking in our country now increasingly about domestic issues, questions of race. But I was referring to the American officials. Ah, America, okay, I was getting to that. Uh, I would think again, too, that Romania is not towards the top of the list in foreign policy. China's the biggest question. Uh, obviously, you know, Russia, North Korea, Iran, that's good. That means you're not a problem, quite honestly. Romania, I, when I look at Romania, I'm a former official, I follow foreign policy. I see it as a country that's become a strong member of NATO and, and Europe, the EU. I see it, uh, it's like, like all societies, it's got its challenges. We were talking beforehand about some of the challenges yes. politically in Romania, given the, your history. But all in all, I actually see Romania as a success story. This has been a country that's had a, not a perfect transition, but a pretty impressive tr transition from where it was three decades, four decades ago to where it is uh, now. So I, I, th I think it's, uh, you know, all in all, very positive. Plus, you've got a significant diaspora in the United States, which, which, which helps. Uh, but it's, it's seen in general as a, a you know, more you know, again, having made this transition to uh, a democratic Western country, people feel good. People, when they hear it, they think good things about it. One of the cheapest wars in terms of money is propaganda. Uh, it's not cheap per se, as a matter of fact, but it's far more cheaper than a conventional war. That's for sure. In certain ways, one of the reasons for the fall of communism in the East was good. American Western propaganda, which had a profound cultural component. Now, the Russians are striking back hard with exactly the same weapon. But the load of this weapon is fundamentally different. What do you think about that? I wouldn't put it quite that way. I would think that one of our real strengths then and now is the reality of our society, our economy, our political system. Mm -hmm. And when it is functioning well, and people see that, it, th that is a powerful uh, tool in the competition. The problem right now, the biggest problem facing us isn't Russia, it's us. When we see the kind of uh, violence in the society, when we see uh, January 6th, when we see our slow response to COVID, it raises fundamental questions about uh, American society and the strength and robustness of our society and our economy. So the, the most important thing in, in this war of ideas is, again, our performance. And if we fix our performance, I'm not worried about Russia or China or anybody else. Uh, plus, 
in the case of Russia, their performance is pretty poor. Russia has never emerged as a modern economy. It's still heavily dependent upon oil and gas. Obviously, its political systems are failure. That Russia's the institutionalization at a level of a, of the concentration of power and wealth. Mm -hmm. I actually think Russia faces a real crisis after Mr. Putin, because there's no real concept of uh, legitimacy in Russia anymore. The question is, uh, who's going to decide who and what takes Mr. Putin's place uh, when he moves to you know that Kremlin in the sky? And at the moment, you and I, can't, we, we're sitting here, we can't predict with any confidence what that process looks like. And the reason is there's, there's nothing that's widely shared. Mm -hmm. We don't know who, what, what the transition looks like, what the post-Putin government, does somebody else enjoy the position of Putin? Probably not. I actually think that's pretty hard to imagine. Is there violence? Possibly. Uh, could there be a reformer again? Maybe. Could the country face tendency, centrifugal tendencies? Maybe. Uh, so I actually think it, it, it's one of the reasons you don't write the legacies of political leaders too soon. We'll see what Mr. Putin's legacy is 25 years after he, gives, he, leaves, mm -hmm. he leaves office. In the meantime, and I will refer now to the people supporting the conspiracy theory. For lots of people, it doesn't matter where the story comes from. They don't care. They don't pay attention to the fact that lots of narratives come from a country where people, investigative journalists and people against the regime are mysteriously disappearing, um, poisoned, uh, point blank shot. Lots of people do not think about that. My question is, why is the American counter-narrative so weak? It's a really interesting question. Uh, I think for the Russians, it's been a real priority to do certain things, to use social media in a very orchestrated way. Uh, they haven't been good at making their own narrative but I think they've been pretty good at interfering with our own society. And right now, we are going through an extraordinarily difficult phase. And we, are, uh, we don't have a good narrative to put out. I'll be honest with you, whether it's issues of guns or race, uh, opioid abuse, getting into inequality, politics, uh, the poor quality of that public education infrastructure. Uh, this is not our finest hour, to use Ronald Reagan's phrase. We, right now, we are not a shining city on a hill. And so again, I don't know if it's that Russia has been so effective, it's just that we, we've been so ineffective in, in many ways. But I, I'm not worried about Russian propaganda uh, in terms of uh, how people see us. I'm not worried about um, their ability to uh, affect our political processes. It's an annoyance, but it's not a mortal threat. Again, I'm more worried about us. I actually think we hold in our hands our own narrative and our own future. So I, I, would, I, would, I would look inwards. And the real question is, can we cure what is currently problematic in America? Can we deal with what is, what is tearing us apart? That, that's the, that, to me, is the big question. And Russia is is tertiary to that. It's not central to that. You use the syntagm governing a chaotic world. What will be the destiny of the liberal world order as we knew it? I am pretty skeptical. The kind of uh, rules-based order that grew out of World War II, uh, the institutions that were built, uh, a lot of this depended on American primacy strong alliances and the rest uh i'm a little bit skeptical of and these alliances we've already discussed there's some uncertainty there global institutions have not kept up they've fallen behind uh, these the emergence of global challenges there really is no institution for dealing with the with cyber the cyberspace climate change the institutions are inadequate we have a non-proliferation treaty but north korea and others are doing what they're 
uh, doing. Uh, so there's lots of there's lots of challenges, and again, the United States is not making a very good uh, example of the rule of law at home. So uh, my own view is the this this Western-led, American-led international order is deteriorating. Could it bounce back? Yes, but that would take a recovery in the United States and the reinvigoration of alliances. It would take a lot of imagination. We really have to recreate a lot of the uh, institutions and arrangements in the world. It's not clear to me we're up, we're up to that. The more likely future is one of deterioration. And we've seen signs of it the last few years where uh, it's not chaos, but it's moving in the direction away from order towards mm -hmm. disorder. Um, my previous book had the word disarray in yep. the title, and I don't know how that translates into Romania, into Romania but it's not anarchy, it's not chaos, yep. but it is things moving in the wrong direction. And I think that's what we're seeing as the result of these global challenges, the rise of China, the alienation of Russia, and the inward, the somewhat inward looking inconsistent policies of the United States. You add all this together, and that is a world that is in worse shape than it was uh, yesterday, and it could be in worse shape yet tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Dr. Haas, my last question is addressed to, to the individual that I'm talking to, not to the expert. Um, <laughs> are we right now, in this very moment, in the eve of a new world order? Look, I ask that a lot. Uh, it's 30 years, three decades since the end of the Cold War. It's three quarters of a century since the end of World War II. Uh, I think the, I don't know the answer to the question, whether I'm not sure that that's to me the person or the expert. The answer mm -hmm. is maybe. There's questions again about China, questions about these globalists. I think the biggest question is the United States. And if the United States can rediscover what made it special for the last 75 years, then I think we can resume, not exactly, but large elements of what we've seen in the world uh, for the last 75 years. We'll obviously have to adapt to these new challenges to China, but if the United States cannot sort itself out, then I think we are moving towards a new, not so much new world order, maybe a new world disorder, uh, in which certain countries where respect for the rule of law goes down. We have some attempt to establish spheres of influence. Uh, global arrangements fall short. That's what worries me. Uh, so I, I actually think the biggest international question in the world is a domestic question. And I, I hope that doesn't sound self-centered as an American. Uh, it's just simply a reflection of the reality that the United States has played this large role in the yeah. world. And the world doesn't organize itself. The world tale takes help to be organized. We can't do it alone, but I'm not sure it can happen without us. So I actually think the biggest international question, again, is a national question as to the future of the United States at home, and then as a result, the future of the United States abroad. I'll just say a few words in Romanian, and then I'll come back to you. Tuturor celor care ne urmăresc, le recomand cu foarte mare căldură Cartea invitatului nostru, tradusă în limba română, Lumea în care trăim, o scurtă introducere, publicată la editura Nemirea. Carta este deja un bestseller New York Times. E o carte absolut fascinantă pentru că e ca un manual de folosire a lumii contemporane. Se poate adresa oricui, e foarte simplu de citit. E o carte fascinantă pe care nu o lași din mână și care te învață ceva despre lumea în care trăiești. Dr. Haas, thank you so much for accepting this interview. It's been a privilege to meet you and good luck with everything that you do. And thank you so much. No, thank you. This, uh, I've done a lot of interviews and this is about as interesting as any I've had. So really, thank you very much. Thank you too. Goodbye and good luck. And stay healthy. Tuturor celor care sunt alături de Garantat 100%, mulțumim frumos pentru încredere. Ne vedem săptămâna viitoare. Noapte bună.